right, folks, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, we've got a couple other folks who might join us um, here over the next hour or so. We want to be mindful of everybody's time. I'm Robert Smith. I direct our Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach here at Marquette University. And we are all Zoom savvy, I'm sure, at this point. Um, we are going to have a conversation today uh, very briefly for about an hour about electronic monitoring and then also encourage uh, us to think not only about the adult realities but youth-based realities regarding EM. We're going to start our conversation with some some basics around electronic monitoring and then get into some more of the details. Today we have some folks who are uh, very uh, deeply informed and deeply engaged in these conversations and uh, we've got some scholar activists who are uh, right in the heart of these questions around this reform effort and on the call with us currently uh, I'll introduce the folks who are here uh, we have Chaz Arnett from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law we have Kate Weisberg from George Washington University Law School and Nicole Young Todd who's here with us from Youth Justice Milwaukee. Uh, we, we will probably be joined also by a couple of other fo folks, James Kilgore from Media Justice and Charlene Moore also from YJM. Uh, this conversation really uh, is a chance for the folks who are with us to touch base with one another again. We had the opportunity back in October of 2019 to be uh, in a set of conversations with us and a whole uh, wide array of other folks who are deeply invested and addressing these emerging issues with surveillance, particularly digital surveillance. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to reconnect, but then also to share some of the work that these folks have been up to in the interim. Uh, both Kate and Chaz have been written, have written some really important work on the topic. I also want to highlight that we have some attendees who um, are, equally as important to this conversation, both directly and indirectly with the work that they've done here locally and as scholars as well. And so I, I acknowledge those attendees and we'll get you into the conversation as soon as we can. Uh, we are going to also be joined very quick. There she is, Charlene Moore is here with us. And so as we get started, folks, I won't, I won't do any formal introductions because I think that the work that they do allows for them to introduce themselves in very impressive ways. And so I've given a short round of intros, but as we continue our conversation here, they will tell us a little bit more about who they are and what they are up to. And so we appreciate uh, you folks taking your time today. So for our panelists, if you will unmute yourselves um, and I will unmute you, that kind of works. Oh, there we go, thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, also, Marisola is in the background with us. Marisola is uh, a doctoral student with us at Marquette who's joined our research team here on electronic monitoring. Some of you may know the name Theodore Williams. Teddy Williams was working with us. Teddy has since graduated and we are excited to say he is employed. Um, so uh, we thank Teddy for the work he's done. How about we get this start, uh, this conversation started? Folks, we, we, we want you to jump in. This is somewhat informal. We know the expertise and the uh, knowledge you bring to the table on this question. Um, Marisola, if you can take us to the next slide, we'll go ahead and get going with some introductory questions. If, if you all as panelists can just give us a little bit of uh, history, a little bit of the backdrop. When we, when we say electronic monitoring, when we talk about EM, particularly the GPS component of electronic monitoring, Tell us what that is. And Chaz or Kate, if you could walk us into this conversation to start with because of your scholarship on this, that would be great for us. What do we mean when we say EM or electronic monitoring? What is that about? Kate, you wanna jump in? Why don't you go ahead? Um, you can start us off, Chaz. Just one procedural thing. James Kilgore can't get on. He just texted me. He needs a new invite, I think. Okay, great. I'll get that over to him. to him. That would be awesome. Yep. Well, so first, um, let me, let me uh, before I just speak a little bit um, about what uh, electronic monitoring is and how we, how we should think about it, just acknowledge um, what's going on in our, our, our country right now. Um, 
in, in terms of um, policing and um, the elevation of, of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I hope that um, as a part of this conversation, um, we can uh, keep, keep in mind how that is um, uh, intimately connected with what's happening in, in uh, the area of corrections and uh, carcerality and, and electronic monitoring um, as well. This overall uh, larger project of the dehumanization of black and brown um, bodies. Um, and, and part of my work and uh, scholarship has been focused on looking um, and exploring race and surveillance issues and um, speaking to how the law is a, a conspirator, a co-conspirator in, 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 um, in facilitating uh, these efforts to watch, to control, and ultimately what we've seen with George Floyd, um, destroy uh, black and brown bodies when um, uh, it is seen fit or necessary um, with little accountability and, 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 and way too much um, impunity. Uh, so I, I just like to say that to sort of frame um, this conversation as well, and that's how we should be thinking about it. Um, but generally, when we're when we're talking about um, electronic monitoring um, in the criminal justice system, we're um, talking about a technology um, that, in uh, many ways, is uh, dated. Uh, in many ways, is rudimentary. Um, it's uh, it works with either uh, radio. Uh, frequency, um, and that is uh, when you have a device, um, most uh, corrections uh, uses this technology that, that clicks and, and attaches to um, an individual's legs, as you see in this, um, this image here. Uh, with the radio frequency um, technology uh, that works with a base, um, it can give um, a signal to corrections when an individual leaves a certain place, designated area, usually um, that is someone's home. Um, oftentimes when an individual is placed on electronic monitoring, it comes um, with orders and stipulations uh, under house arrest for a person to be within the home, either at all times or at um, certain times during the day. Um, so that is uh, what we would consider like one of the two categories, the radio frequency electronic monitoring device. And then there's the, uh, uh, the device in which works off of global positioning systems, which we call uh, GPS. And that is the units uh, that when attached to an individual can follow um, a person and track their location uh, wherever they go, not just as a way of indicating whether they have left a certain place, but literally uh, total and uh, complete uh, surveillance of where a person goes. Um, and I'm, I'm sure in this conversation we'll get into how uh, the sort of uh, barriers and, and, and challenges that, that comes along with that sort of surveillance. Um, and maybe Kate can speak more to this as well, but what we're seeing now beyond this basic um, understanding of electronic monitoring is these new additions and features um, uh, such as, you know, being able to um, uh, engage in audio uh, uh, technology as well, speaking to individuals through uh, the electronic monitoring um, unit, um, being able to engage in voice recognition and uh, connecting with cell phone applications using other biometric uh, measures, you know, facial recognition and fingerprinting and, and, and those sorts of things. So um, at, at its core, the, the technology is, is quite basic, um, uh, but they're certainly rolling out and, and, and attempting to roll out um, many more updated features, uh, which makes it even more scary in terms of collecting biometric data. Yeah, thanks, Chaz. We appreciate that. That was very thorough. Kay, you want to add some more to that for us? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for, um, for organizing this and, and just to echo Chaz and recognizing the, um, the heaviness of today and the, you know, the last few days and um, both because I think this conversation about surveillance is racialized and very much part of what's happening right now all around the country. Um, but I also think that, and this is just, you know, I can't tell you how much it means to me to be part of this group because I do feel like in moments like these dark moments, having the space to have conversations and connect as a community um, is incredibly meaningful. So I feel, special, I feel especially grateful um, to be in conversation with you all in, in this moment in time. So, so many thanks for organizing this. Uh, you know, everything, I, I, to, to add to what 
Chaz has said, I think the other thing that connects to what's happening right now, and hopefully James will be on the call soon, because I know he's, he's been thinking about this too and writing about it, the ways in which electronic monitoring is morphing right now in really insidious ways, sort of under the guise of being a, quote, alternative to prisons and jails, especially in the COVID era, era um, we're seeing an uptick in the use of monitoring and surveillance. And what's so troubling is that it's an uptick, not just in the number of people who are on monitors, but also the type of monitoring. So we're seeing more location data, location tracking apps that are on people's cell phones, including cell phones where, you know, probation, a probation uh, agency or a private company will give someone a cell phone and say, okay, this is your cell phone. Um, and it, it's not just their movement, but it also tracks, you know, everything they're doing on that cell phone. And, and it's all under the guise of being a positive alternative to incarceration. Um, of course, for those of us who've been working in this area, we know that this, quote, positive alternative narr narrative is um, super troubling, not just because it's not, it, you know, it's not necessarily true for that matter. You know, plenty of people should just be straight released, not released on a monitor. And so it's not really being used as an alternative. It's just being to add on to someone's sentence or to simply add on to already onerous release conditions when it's not necessary at all. So I think that's one interesting way that electronic monitoring right now is shifting in the COVID sort of post, not post, unfortunately, but, you know, mid-COVID era. Thank you both. Let's let's get uh, Charlene and uh, Nicole in. You all work with young people in particular. Uh, you, you've seen this significant uptick in the, the use of EM in a whole range of ways. Can you talk a little bit about the work you will all do and how you are uh, engaging with electronic monitoring on a regular basis? Nikki, I'll let you jump in first. Okay, I was just about to defer to you. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm Nicole, or Nikki, as everyone else calls me. Um, so I right now to be honest with you i that's exactly what we're seeing you know my agency actually even though i don't directly work with adults um through my agency the increase in electronic monitoring has been you know very significant um in this time period i mean they cleared out i think it was definitely hundreds and hundreds it might have been 500 people from the house of corrections which is an adult facility Juven the juvenile detention center in Milwaukee County is down to, um, I don't know, it's really low. It's a shark. Less, it's than, a less than 60? Yeah, I was going to say 50 ish. 50, 50 ish. yeah. That's, you know, the capacity is 120. So that's, that's not normal for Milwaukee. Um, we've seen a lot of young people that would have been placed in shelter care go home on electronic monitor. They all have the bracelet though. Like, Anyone who was supposed to be in shelter or who was in shelter, who was reevaluated really throughout March and April, like they just, they went home and we've been applauding that. Like I was on a call the other day with the Department of Justice, um, uh, Charlene's on the um, State Juvenile Justice Commission. And um, uh, so I just serve on one little committee of it and we look at, um, legislation, policy, and uh, compliance. And it's interesting because there were so many people on the call who deal with corrections in different ways, like the head of all the youth prisons in Wisconsin's on the call, and he's bragging about how few kids there are there because they've been able to, um, the head of, uh, I think, Dane County's, um, which is where Madison is located, um, their juvenile detention center, um, also is saying like this, we don't need as many kids in correction. Like this is not, this has been a huge lesson that we shouldn't, that should not be lost on us. So I think for us, it's a moment where the judges can see, and there haven't been issues. And that's, and that's the other thing. The judges can see that these young people can be released safely to home, at least a lot of them, that previously it would have been defaulted to be detention or shelter. And this is their discretion. And um, to just understand that that this is possible, I think is a major lesson. And so I'm hoping to capitalize on that and really show them, even though the goal is abolition, obviously, you know, at least acknowledge this in a formal policy-driven way. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Nikki. And um, Rob, thank you so much for this space to be able to have this very important conversation. Um, I will be sharing my sentiments and my comments from a lens of um, a parent. Uh, we recently adopted a young person that came out of um, Copper Lake back in the middle of March and uh, she was required and still is, um, her time isn't up yet, to be on um, electronic monitoring until the middle, about the middle of June. And, and, and this was a three month time span, which is, you know, for us was quite a bit um, of time. And it's really interesting, you know, when I, just, just from personal experience, um, you know, really digging into the different types of EM, you know, the what because of her statue, she's small and petite. Um, she was fortunate enough, you know, to have um, a monitor that was battery operated. And so, you know, she charges her batteries. Um, she's able to bring an extra one with her if we're out and about um, in the community. But, you know, what I've realized with this experience is that it's not just the electronic monitoring that um, that's going to whip our young people into shape. It's not, you know, folks are thinking it's this magical device that's going to transform, um, um, in this case, a young person. It's not. And um, the, the, just the psychological toll that goes with um, having this device, you know, she's a lot of times, if it's not put on correctly, there were times that she had to actually get it. This is her third one. It had to be changed out. Um, you know, if it's not put on correctly, it's painful. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of issues that go with it, but I think what I want, you know, especially the listening audience to understand that we have to start digging a lot deeper when we talk about um, what it is that young people need. You know, they're looking at the root causes and how do we support young people? What are the conversations that, are, that we need to have? What are the opportunities that they need to be engaged in? Those are the things that's going to transform young people not having an electronic monitor on their ankle and, and thinking that, oh, it's going to make them you know, ch transform and change their lives. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Thank you so very much, Charlotte. Folks, we are trying to get James into our conversation and you all know how this goes. Sometimes the, the digital technology just does whatever it wants to do, no matter what you try to do to outmaneuver it. Uh, we'll, we'll continue going. Thank you for what, is, what was a very rich uh, overview uh, and I also want to encourage our attendees because of uh, you all's expertise, please uh, make sure to to offer your thought. Okay, there we go, James. I, uh, welcome. Are you are are you able to communicate with us, James? All right, we're getting closer. We we're getting closer. Um, uh, let's let's continue to move forward and if you go ahead and skip to the next slide we're gonna dig in uh, with a little bit more detail uh, let's talk about some of the challenges that arise with EM uh, particularly with young people and as soon as we're able to get James to, to communicate with us he can talk about some of his uh, knowledge and awareness there we go um, alrighty uh, Kate, you might recognize this. Uh, this we borrowed from uh, some work that uh, was where your, your research was featured. We want to give you all as panelists a chance to talk about some of the challenges. Uh, Charlene kind of walked us into that conversation. What are some of the challenges that are emerging with the use of electronic monitoring, very broadly and specifically? And uh, we'll go back to either Chaz or Kate to get us started with the, those comments. Chaz, take you. You can. I spoke most recently, so you. <laughs> you, all, you all are being too polite, but we appreciate you. <laughs> uh, that's that's um, that's great. Thanks, Kate. Um, so I, I mean, just to kick it off, and 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 thinking about um, the challenges and, and and barriers that arise, um, specifically in the, in in the context of using. Um, these virtual shackles, you know, which I which I like to refer to them as um, on uh, minors, 
Um, I think one of the one of the first things um, we can speak to, and I think um, uh, Charlene put it uh, nicely when um, she described um, these electronic monitors as being um, presumed uh, magical devices that will lead to some um, some some great outcome or some some great behavior changes and. And I, I suspect we uh, maybe in some of the later questions we'll we'll get to that and, and, and thinking about um, you know effectiveness and what the perspectives are because I suspect that um, they don't really believe um, what they put out as the the, the um, true purposes of, of using uh, this technology and um, uh, the real um, aims and goals and ambitions is is strictly around um, surveilling and, and, and controlling and to that extent. Uh, they are quite effective. Um, another thing that they are uh, extremely effective in, in doing is severing. Um, uh, I like to talk about um, the, the severing that takes place and severing uh, kids from their communities and severing kids uh, from their families and severing kids from their uh, schools. And one of the things that we know uh, specifically with the uh, juvenile justice system, juvenile injustice system, is that uh, kids are often coming in contact with the system because they have been failed in some way, right? Either they have been failed by uh, their schools, they've been failed by um, uh, some uh, adults, um, uh, they've been failed by local government, national government. Um, and and, and uh, for those reasons, um, uh, they're pushed uh, towards coming in contact with the juvenile justice system. And one of the things that, um, sort of can act as a protector in, in, in helping um, adolescents develop is connections to their, um, to their families, to their communities, to activities, um, as, as Charlene uh, noted. And these electronic monitors uh, erect barriers uh, to, those, uh, to those connections, right? I, I think about, um, uh, I didn't mention, but for many years I was um, a public defender. Um, I worked in Baltimore at, at, uh, representing um, uh, minors. I've had minors in uh, in my family, uh, my nephews and cousins, um, as, as minors placed in electronic monitoring, and just seeing how um, the policies um, uh, around this technology act to um, uh, dehumanize and push push kids away. I think about one kid I represented um, who was um, a star football player. Um, he was in high school. Uh, once he was placed on electronic monitoring uh, for this property crime, um, he could not participate in football any longer. Um, I remember having to call uh, emergency hearing um, at the court um, around Thanksgiving. Um, he and his family, um, it was their tradition every year to go to their grandmother who lived in Virginia, not too far um, from, from Baltimore. And just the, the, um, uh, the, the policies that you had to abide by to try to just get permission to go and see family. He ultimately, um, trying to get in touch with his probation officer and, 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 and others in the juvenile justice system, couldn't do it. Um, he got left home um, and while his family traveled to Virginia. Um, and, you know, so you think about these things and watching how um, he deteriorated and, and, and spiraled um, after that, um, it really, put you in a position where you have to question, like, what is the overall aim? What is the overall intent of using these technologies in this, in this way? Just to add to that, I, you know, I think that um, it, there's no empirical evidence that electronic monitoring is rehabilitative or serves a deterrent function or really does much good of anything with anyone, much less young people. And if anything, I think that not just, you know, I think that there's so much, so many reasons to, to see how electronic monitoring undermines rehabilitation. And frankly, you know, basically what Chaz is saying is such a poor fit for adolescent development. I'm part of the, I mean, there are many problems, but you know, the, the, the rules and regulations that accompany the monitor are so onerous and so challenging that it's not just the physical monitor, it's also the planning your life 48 hours in advance. Um, I mean, we in California, we did a study of the rules in California. You know, on average, there's 30 separate rules that young people have to abide by. And of course it impacts not just them, but also their family members. 
puts their family members in a position of having to plan their lives around their children. Um, it is very intrusive into the sort of family domain of sort of the state having this really big presence in family life. Um, you know, like Chaz, I represented young people um, in California and certainly had, you know, just so many bad experiences, just could see from what my clients were going through just how much they struggled. I remember one young person I worked with, um, he never wanted to go to school. He had a learning disability and the school was doing a really poor job of supporting him. He finally went to school. The first day he goes to school in the middle of the day, in the middle of class rather, his monitor starts buzzing and beeping and he stops the class and says, why is your monitor? What is that on your ankle? Why is it buzzing? What crime did you commit? And surprise, surprise, that young man never went back to school after that. Um, violated the condition of his probation that he attends school every day. Um, so this is one example of many of how how much um, electronic monitoring is a poor fit for adolescents. And we also haven't yet touched on, and I know there are other experts on this call about this topic too, is just the financial implications. Um, in every jurisdiction except California, families are billed for their children to be on electronic monitors. Um, and so that also um, is is really burdensome and really troubling as well. But I'll I'll stop there because I know there are other folks on the call. Yeah, thanks, Kay. We're gonna we're gonna get, ask you all to talk a little bit about some of those financial implications if you can get some of those thoughts loaded up. James Kilgore, how you doing, brother? You there with us? I'm good. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Give us some of your thoughts. Welcome, um, uh, you all. Uh, I want to quickly say James Kilgore has done some really important work around this issue along with the other folks on the call. James, tell us a little bit about what you do and, and offer some of your thoughts. And I know you work largely with the adult populations. Right. Thanks so much for uh, taking the trouble to get me in the side door here. I, had a, I guess I had the wrong link or something, so I apologize for making trouble in terms of getting in, but it's really great to be here. Um, so just a couple of reflections of it. As you say, I, I've worked mostly on adult uh, on adults with electronic monitoring, uh, having spent a year on a shackle myself, so it kind of inspired my research. But uh, I think I, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to, to see kind of where this technology is going. I, I believe that we're beginning to see the end of the ankle shackle, and that I think this is gonna be moving more and more toward smartphone-based uh, uh, tracking and data collection. Just this morning, I read that Akron is putting a thousand of their 4,000 people on probation. Uh, they're, they're giving them a, a smartphone app that is gonna track their location, but also gather a bunch of other biometrics. In Illinois, where I live, they went around to everybody who was on parole, who wasn't already on an electronic monitor and made them download the BI SmartLink app to their phone. You check in with uh, facial and voice recognition. It can track your location. It can gather other biometrics. Uh, so I think my, my concern really is, I mean, there's a lot of concerns. In this particular moment, I mean, I've spent a lot of time fighting against the use of electronic monitors, but in this particular moment where people are stuck in prisons, stuck in jails, which in my mind are really kill boxes, they're, you know, it's a potential death sentence, getting them out on a monitor is a, a, a victory of sorts, which is, is, is problematic. But at the same time, I think these companies are using the COVID emergency as an opportunity to introduce new technology and to you know, digitize this more and make these more, not so much tracking devices, but actually data collection devices, pure surveillance devices. They offer services like you know, telling you when you have an appointment or a court date, or maybe providing you with a list of resources that uh, may, may be helpful to you in your rehabilitation, so-called. But at the same time, it may be gathering other biometrics, it may be gathering biometrics, or it may be gathering video of the community you live, the household you live, and putting all, the, all these into these clouds where all this data gets gathered and really is, is weaponized against the people who are in the criminal legal system already, people who are already criminalized, this data is more and more becoming a way to limit their access to housing, employment, medical care, credit, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're looking at a whole set of changes coming down 
Um, another thing that's, that's happening, and I'll stop after this, is that these companies are repackaging their devices as uh, quarantine management. I just read this morning where Supercom, an Israeli-based company, is exporting a quarantine management package to two other countries in the Middle East, which is basically their electronic ankle monitor dolled up with a few other bells and whistles. So it's really, it's really pretty scary that these people can get away with all this stuff under the cover of public, under the cover of public health. And of course, a lot of us aren't paying much attention to what's happening in, in the world of surveillance because we're so worried about the, you know, COVID deaths and the particularly uh, the deaths of people who are in, facing incarceration. So I think, I think we have to be looking you know, broadly at where are these devices going and be seeing how they're connecting up with the broader surveillance state uh, apparatus rather than simply being location trackers. Well, thank you folks. That's, that's uh, uh, all very frightening and all very disturbing, but it gets us right at, at the heart of the problems and the, the challenges with reform and the way the reform will often make matters far worse um, if we are not diligent about addressing uh, reform efforts. Let, let's get into uh, more directly this question of effectiveness and ineffectiveness. What doesn't work? What, is the, what, are, what, are, what are these things supposed to be doing? And then let's, let's talk about what we probably can call the political economy of it. Who are the companies out there? How does this work financially? Uh, uh, the burdens that are placed on families, uh, any of those thoughts would be more than welcomed at this moment. And Charlene or, or, or Nikki, if you wanna jump into some of these questions, you've seen this up close working with young people. Uh, you've seen this working with families. What are some of your thoughts about ineffectiveness or effectiveness and then also Tell us a little bit about some of these financial burdens. Let's, let's get a little more depth into that. Absolutely. Shard yeah, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Nikki. No, why don't you go? I didn't mean to. No, 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 that, that's okay. I was, I, apologies, talking to um, uh, Donna's PO. <laughs> um, uh, again, when you, you talk about it's never on um, your time. Um, but you, um, again, when I mentioned that, um, Donna's, um, Donna had a different sort of um, uh, EM device, uh, which definitely allowed her not to be attached to, so the regular, um, if she would have had a regular device, she would have had to charge it via plug. So find an outlet, you know, stay, you know sit around the outlet until um, her device um, was charged. And again, if you're going out and about, um, and your device is low, you have to find a plug somewhere um, in order to um, charge it. So again, we were in this sort of fortunate state uh, to have a device that was um, um, uh, battery operated, but that came to the tune of about almost $2,500 versus um, the traditional device, which ranged about um, $2,000. And of course, because of that, uh, obviously, uh, the, um, and a lot of times young people cut them off, um, cut off their bracelets. And so, uh, a lot of times, um, the, uh, you know, institutions would prefer to go with the, um, least expensive, um, option. Um, again, these sorts of things, you know, and, and we, I've talked to Donna about like, you know, like having this device on doesn't um, doesn't make you a better person. It doesn't say, oh, I'm going to do this good because I have this device on. It doesn't, you know, none of that comes into play. Um, a lot of times she's worried about, you know, again, um, and, I, and Kate, you mentioned this, this sort of perception. It does really incredible harm because again, the development of a young person, um, it does a lot of harm to them. Um, and they're very subconscious of you know how they are being perceived when walking around with these sorts of devices you know on them we've connected with other young people that again you know talks about how cumbersome um, they are and you know and a big part of it how it makes them appear how it makes them look right and so um, again there has to be other methods and other tools that we can use to support young people because these sorts of, you know, things don't do it. 
Thanks, Charlotte. Nikki, you want to add any thoughts to that? Yeah, I mean, the, the comment, I mean, I agree with all of that. And I don't have the perspective of, as a, of a parent, just a service provider, but they just really say that, you know, they're waiting. Basically, they, my understanding from the way they talk about it is like that everyone knows they're going to make a mistake, they're going to screw up, and they're just waiting for that to happen and like to catch them. And so they do, you know, they do definitely, you know, cut it off. They purposely let it go dead. So it's like, they're not, I also like, don't think the rules of the court like really matter to them so much in terms of electronic monitoring, because it just, and again, I'm not trying to group all the young people together at all, because some of them obviously take it very seriously. And, um, you know, their families are, are, are really strict about it. Um, but like, at the end of the day, it's just like one more thing that we're piling onto them. And it's just like it's just, if the little things they can control sometimes are just like, well, whatever, like, I'm not going to wear this. I'm not going to do what you say. But to be honest, a lot of them, you know, it's become such a routine on their body that they don't like they are excited to get rid of it. They definitely look forward to that day. Like they're excited for that to be over. But like, they just, it's so normal. Like you walk into any youth serving space for um, correction, young people that are involved in the correctional system and there's chargers. Like in our program, we program spaces, we have to have chargers always on hand because so many of the young people have these bracelets that they must charge while they're in programming. That doesn't even make sense. Like they live with us. They, you know, they live in our space where we're with them all the time why would you need that additional piece? Like, yes, they can leave, but it like doesn't make sense that you would have, you know, them in programming during the day, or I'm sorry, after school, come home back to a residential place um, program and then still have a bracelet. Like that doesn't make any sense. So I think to Kate's earlier point is it's always an add-on, always. And um, that, to me, I know this might not be adding to your uh, question about effectiveness, but I think we don't really know the answer to that question because you can look at all the different, you know, statistics about deterrence and rehabilitation and all those things that you, you measure through, um, you know, if you can afford to have those types of studies. And I don't, I am sure it's never been done in Milwaukee or even Wisconsin that, that we've looked at it on that level. But when you, I think the important thing about what we want to do in Milwaukee is to ask the kids and the judges, like, what is your purpose? Like, what is the intended purpose? Because I don't think they know. I don't think True. the judge, well, I think they'll, they'll stumble into an answer. I don't think it's clear. And I think it'll vary from one judge to the next. I think it'll obviously be so they don't commit another offense. Like, that'll be what everyone basically says. But you know, trying to really get, like, do the work to get them to understand, you know, the, on, you know, is it effective from the purpose of, um, you know, to, I mean, first of all, is it effective to not get them to commit another crime? I think that, like, or another offense, like, that's important, but also to look at the violations that they're being caught on and just really understand that when you look at all the reasons young people are pulled back into detention or, sometimes sent into corrections, depending on how many chances they've been given, those are completely ridiculous reasons. It's just that there's a lot of them. There's a lot of curfew violations. There's a lot of going into exclusion zones. There's a lot of, so like skipping school or whatever. Like, so it's a lot of little stupid things that all kids do. And that's what adds up to them violating. And it's not like they did commit another offense. Some do. We've had kids, you know, steal cars with their bracelets on. But like, they, they typically, it's not a reoffense. I can tell you that. Like the, when they're involved in court programs, their recidivism rate during that involvement is incredibly low. So they're, so I, I don't mean to ramble so much. I just really, I feel like once we pin them down and say, look at, like, really look at this. I think that's the only way they're going to start to understand from an evaluative perspective, like this doesn't make sense. But then if that one person does something really bad when they're on electronic monitoring, that is going to be the backlash that says this doesn't even work. They all need to be locked up. You know, like that's, that's 
my fear also is that, you know, the other extreme end that doesn't like electronic monitoring because they don't think it's like for the other reason. They think all people should be incarcerated um, if they do anything wrong. You know, we have, we have some of those people in Milwaukee. So we just had, just really quickly, we had someone who was monitored from our agency who was, um, he was an adult, but he was on an electronic, I'm sorry, he was on the bracelet, but he was um, a domestic um, abuser. Uh, he's had a history of that. He was on the bracelet and he set her car, his partner's car, former partner's car on fire with himself in it. And there wasn't enough time to track him. There wasn't enough time to stop it the device failed basically to do what it was supposed to do. Like it just, it didn't protect anything. It didn't, it didn't stop that from happening. Yeah, and you. so it was, it was really dramatic. And this was a few days ago. So I just, anyway, I'll, I'll end it there. But I really think that the answer is to get people to say, to, to define what is the purpose because until we agree on that, how can we really evaluate it? Thank you. Uh, Nikki, thank, thank you. you so much for that. Can I jump in really quick? I know I'm Marisola in the background, but I just, I need to mention what, what really came through from what you said is the strict discipline connected to this strict punishment. And I'm coming at this as you know, a child who grew up with strict parents, right? It's not, um, I'm not trying to um, create equivalents here, but kids rebel against strict discipline. <laughs> and if they're being so heavily disciplined for doing things that a normal kid would do that sounds like a complete backfire and and a trap right and uh and and punitive in nature so to me it just seems completely illogical i just yeah. wanted to say that oh well, thank you thank you for those comments kate can you talk to it you know I, what, what i have learned from all of you all is uh the importance around phrases and ideas such as net widening um, and more recently, you all have educated me on the wide scale use of uh, EM pretrial. Kay, can you talk to us a little bit about how this is being used uh, pretrial and some of the challenges and problems associated with that use? You know, I'm happy to talk about pretrial. To be honest, I'm not the pretrial expert on this call. I okay. I don't want to put James on the spot, but James, put James on the spot. <laughs> I'm gonna put James on the spot because James has been doing really amazing work on the pretrial space. So I'm I'm gonna pass the baton to him for this question. If that if if you give me permission to do that, absolutely, absolutely, that's, please do. That's very unkind of you, Kate. But <laughs> you are so not welcome. <laughs> I'll try. So I think I mean I think the 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 thing about Pre-trial is that we, we find that putting people on electronic monitor pre-trial, A, they haven't been convicted of anything, yet you're really incarcerating them in their home. There's, there's the idea that they can freely work and do all of those kinds of things, but that's not the reality. Quite often they're on very strict house arrest and they can't actually get out and go to work or they're very limited in terms of what they can go to work, uh, when they can go to work. I mean, Rob has mentioned also the cost some places are up to $35 a day to be on an electronic monitor. So people are getting out without putting up a cash bail, but by the time they end up paying their electronic monitoring fees, it may amount to more than what they would have paid on their cash bail. And then I think just a last thing that's really important is that one of the reasons we advocate for releasing people pretrial without having to pay a bond is that when they're kept in jail, it becomes a source of pressure on them to take a plea bargain that they don't really want, but they take the plea bargain just to get out of jail. And so what we found is that people who are pre-trial face the same dilemma. They're either locked in their house all the time and they wanna get out of their house so they accept a plea bargain that they don't want, or they see the bill for electronic monitoring escalating and escalating so they just say, I don't care. I'll plead guilty to a felony. As long as you don't make me go to prison, I don't care. Let me just pay these bills and get on and get on with my life. So it really mimics incarcceration in a jail in, 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 a, in a lot of ways. And maybe one last point is that the, from the standpoint of the institution, they'll say that it saves money, but they usually calculate this, well, it costs 
I don't know, $35 a day to have somebody in, in um, you know, $100 a day to have somebody in jail and only $10 a day to have them on electronic monitoring. And that looks impressive, but in actual fact, even when they release people on electronic monitoring, they're not necessarily cutting back on the costs in the jail. They don't cut back on staff. They don't close down wings of buildings. They're, they're probably spending just about as much money as they were before. So even this money savings can sometimes be mythical more than that. Thank you very much. Uh, Kate or Chaz, do you want to jump in and offer any other thoughts? And for our attendees, I'm going to unmute um, you all. We're about five or so minutes out of our time frame. Uh, we want to be re respectful of folks' time, but Kate or Chaz, if you want to jump in and add any other more, uh, any more information to uh, these uh, topics where we are now, please do. And then I'm going to unmute our guests so that they can begin to, to chime in as well. I'll just say, um... A couple of things very, very, very quickly. And, and um, the first was um, tied to a point that I think uh, Nikki was making that had me uh, thinking about a couple of things and um, particularly around um, judges um, uh, not knowing um, what, they're, what they're doing with electronic monitoring. And, and in thinking about that um, at a basic level, um, I'm like, yeah, but then at, 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 a, at a, another level, whether it's, whether it's conscious or subconscious or how it's operating, I think in some ways they do know what they're doing, right? And um, I, I think that um, these uh, systems uh, that we see manifested now are like so old and, and pervasive and, 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 and tied to this, um, racial injustice lineage, you know, stemming, stemming from uh, slavery through, you know, convict leasing to Jim Crow, uh, to mass incarceration to, to now. And whether it's um, an individual actor as a, as a cog in, in, in the wheel, I mean, I think the overall um, goal has, has been the same and that is subordination, right? And that is, that is control and that is, that is uh, surveillance and, and, and monitoring and, uh, ultimately um, dehumanizing with the goal of reaping um, capital interests um, and being able to exploit um, those who are, are surveilled. And, you know, one of um, the, the things I try to stress when I, you know, when I talk to people about um, uh, uh, electronic um, monitoring is that we're at, we're at this place in society now where we use the criminal justice system as a, as, as a way of trying to control and regulate, particularly people of color and poor people, right? And uh, the introduction and the use of electronic monitoring, whether it's this physical form now, or is it, um, you know, uh, less visible, uh, as James mentioned, moving into to the use of cell phone and, and, and reaping biometric data, and, and, and regardless of what um, shape it, 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 um, um, it, it, it takes, it's, it's extenuating um, and, and continuing to, to use um, carcerality as, as a way to regulate um, people. And, and I think that is something that is known. So one of the things that I think that we need to do is, is, is generate counter narratives, because now the narrative is that this is about uh, safety. And, I, and, you know, and I, I respect the distinctions that are created, in, you know, between pretrial trial and, and, and post-conviction as well. Um, but I think we also need to have conversations about what, you know, what it is, um, you know, crosses all of those spheres. I mean, each one has uh, different reasons why we shouldn't be doing it. But overall, I think um, the, the, the goals and what, what the narrative is, um, is the same. And we need to be on the forefront of creating um, counter narratives to push back and say, this has nothing to do with public safety. This has nothing uh, uh, to do with appearing in court or flight risks. Um, this is what's um, really happening. Um, so that's something that I try to do with um, uh, uh, my work. And um, I'm happy that everyone else is, 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 um, is locked in and loaded because I think that there's so much to do on this front and connecting it to these larger movements as well, as well around you know, Black Lives Matter. Thanks, Chaz. Kate, you want to add anything there? And folks, attendees, please jump in. Anya, I see your hand up there. Um, uh, we want to give Kate a chance to add anything there. And then Anya, please, please share your thoughts. I'm happy. Let's, I'd love to have the um, attendees um, ask questions. Sure. Go right ahead, Anya. 
Hi, um, thank you so much. This is so useful to me. This is so important. Rob, thank you for organizing this. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Sciences here at Marquette. Um, I'm a sociologist by training and I'm a <laughs> long society scholar. And um, I am hoping to get into some electronic monitoring research myself in, in my next project. And one of the things that I would be really curious to, to hear more about is the relationship of um, these private industries um, and electronic monitoring and the degree to which, um, I don't know, the, who's getting paid and who is overseeing this and to what degree it's outsourced and you know, what's the role of, of Silicon Valley in all of this as everything becomes more app-based. Um, if, if any of the panelists have insights um, about the relationship with the private sector, I think, you know, especially during the protests right now, and we see all these private companies, you know, saying Black Lives Matter, and but we know the, the way in which um, apps and cell phone data are being used um, against uh, people of color and, and individuals who aren't even currently connected to the criminal justice system. Um, so I'm very, very curious in this, um, about this intersection and what you all have, have found so far. Feel free to jump in folks. Anybody wants to uh, address those questions? I can, this is Kate. I mean, I think that um, the private industry has a huge role. I mean, that's what, part of what is making all this so troubling is that, I mean, not that prisons and jails and pretrial release previously were, you know, somehow working well, but I think the implications of the, the sort of growing role of private industry is, are very far reaching. Not only, of course, is there profit motive and sort of desire to just make as much money as possible, um, but there's also problems with transparency. So it's incredibly hard to file public record act. <laughs> you can't file public record act requests on private companies. Um, so, you know, all these devices and tracking apps are being used and it's impossible to even know how in fact they're being used because private companies aren't turning this over. It's also um, the, the implications of private companies also, you can see it in terms of just like who's making policy. So instead of judges and probation officers and police making policy, and again, not that they make great policy, the reality is today, much of how electronic monitoring works is governed by decisions made by private actors, by these like private companies that are deciding how their, you know, how to, how their monitors work. Um, and then similarly, we have tons of questions about privacy, which we would have if it, it was, you know, government um, administering monitoring, but it's the same privacy concerns apply to private companies, if not more. Um, again, you know, when we were looking at the policies and procedures in California, None of the policies even talk about privacy or what happens to the data or with whom it's shared. And we know, at least anecdotally, that in many jurisdictions, the data is shared directly with law enforcement. Um, and so I think these are some of the ways, perhaps more, the less obvious ways that I think privatization raises uh, a lot of really big red flags that are especially problematic with respect to privatization. Thanks. Nikki, your hands up. You want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to respond quickly um, to the earlier comment I think Chaz made, um, and I, I totally appreciate that point about, you know, I probably sounded a bit naive um, in terms of the judges and what they do or don't know they're doing. Definitely part of a historical pattern, and um, the thing is that of course, some of it's subconscious, some of it's not. I think that in order to approach ref like policy changes, at least in Milwaukee. And Shar, please correct me if you think this is wrong, but they've been very defensive. Of course, that's probably true. Anytime you tell someone you're doing something super racist and, you know, oppressive and, you know, there's a history of this, but they, you know, in order to actually get them to pay attention and look at us as, as I guess, partners, I think that messaging has been really difficult for us to kind of get to the point of saying it's more of an inside strategy um, at this point to try to get them to change things and look at things and evaluate things through research and you know thoughtful discussion and and so to, to 
to bring that up, I think obviously we have to, but I'm trying to figure out a way to do it where we're not like calling this white woman presiding judge, you know, like making her feel racist <laughs> and making her feel like she's the problem, you know, even though that might be how we would like to approach it. So I guess for me, that's something that I don't know what to do in Milwaukee. And of course the judges keep rotating, but we've had all these race conversations, like there's race conferences I couldn't go to the one this last February. I know, Shar, you went, you spoke. Um, But it's like, yeah, we're all there. And I usually go to those. We're all there in this room, this huge room, this auditorium. We're going to change this. It's going to end today. This is ridiculous. We all agree. And then we leave and nothing changes. And so it, and it's like every single year, like clockwork. So I don't know. I just wanted to say that in in terms of reform. I don't want to say reform, but, you know, transformation efforts have been um, difficult. And if really quick, if I can just add um, to that, when we talk about transformation, I mean, a lot of the counties and I'm sure uh, folks are looking for, um, or maybe looking for ways to do things differently, but they're really looking for some sort of national model, right? Uh, When we were um, going to different, you know, cities looking at the work of different jurisdiction. We we were fortunate enough to stumble upon um, the work that DC was doing, um, and they said we you know we know this doesn't work. Um, we you know the maximum allowable amount of time we put a young person on EM is thirty days. That is the maximum. If it has to go over that, they there's all sorts of authorizations and approval um, that an individual, a worker, a staff um, have to acquire in order to have a young person um, on EM longer. Uh, they've involved credible messengers and just a lot of other sort of reform sort of work, putting more funding into back into the community, back into where young people live and reside. And um, I think places such as that, Milwaukee have been, you know, looking at like, oh, what are other people doing? And I think we need to have that more sort of showing as to, you know what, Folks are moving in a direction, direct, different direction. Look at this city. Look at that city, right? Look at what New York, you know, is doing, even with their close to home model and how they're um, looking at um, how they quote unquote track uh, young people. So definitely, um, I, I think places such as a Milwaukee, you know, really look to other um, cities and look to other places to see what they're doing and seeing if it's effective. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. We have one more question, folks, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Samina Mula, who's also a member of our faculty at Marquette, wants us to talk a little bit about the implication with uh, immigration detention centers and how uh, EM is playing out in those environments and with those populations. Do any of the panelists have some thoughts to share about uh, how this particular uh, set of strategies with EM is playing out with uh, the question of immigration and immigration detention centers? Um, anybody else? If nobody else wants to go, I can say a few things. But. No, please. Go right ahead, yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things that, this is where, okay, BI is the biggest electronic monitoring company in the country, the subsidiary of the GEO Group, private prison operator. And they really have the, a, a monopoly contract on electronic monitoring for immigrants. They've been using this smart link, as they call it, uh, that cell phone based app for two or three years now on immigrants. They've kind of been experimenting and now they have about 20,000 people on this device. So they're using it to track people. And I think uh, they don't report like to a probation or a parole officer the way in which other people do, but they get tracked. And the, I think the classic example and something we need to learn from in August of 2019, there was a, a immigration raid, an ICE raid in, on three factories in Mississippi, and they had tracked all the people there as being undocumented. They not only tracked them to the, to the place where they were working and went and rounded up six or 700 of them, but they also targeted this particular factory because it's a place where union organizing was taking place. So they targeted people on the basis of being undocumented, on the basis of 
who they were connected to in that workplace, and then they and then on the basis of their political activity. So I think this is this is kind of a, a look into the future about how these various databases that they have blend together and create a different technology of control. For the ordinary pe people who aren't involved in that, who are on immigration uh, monitors, basically they, they get tracked all the time and they have to report like once a month to a probation officer, or an immigration officer, and that's really about it. In most cases, it's not as strict as we find in pretrial juvenile or pro post uh, prison usages. Great, thank you all so very much. We can go to our last slide now. Ten arguments against <clears throat> pretrial electronic monitoring. Here are some, I think, really important lessons here. And, and James, obviously, you you were very instrumental in providing uh, these comments here and these these suggestions. And so we want to, uh, as we wrap up, give you all as panelists a chance to just say any parting provide any parting comments uh, using no more, no more shackles here in these 10 arguments as a portion uh, of your, your thoughts and your comments. Chaz, I see your mic's unmuted. If you wanna say anything at all uh, relative to our previous comments, please do. Otherwise, we, we'd like the panelists to just offer a, a closing comment or so. I guess I, I can do both, I guess. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Uh, in, 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 in this moment. Um, so I, I mean, it, it, and, and connected to the um, question about immigration, I, I think that um, electronic monitors are, are used um, in quite the same way as in, in a juvenile justice system. Uh, I think that their use um, in a juvenile justice system and an immigration system exposes this um, uh, false divide uh, that, that we attempt to uh, make between uh, criminal justice system and, and immigration system, which we know is is is, is false, um, and also this distinction that we try to make between juvenile justice, you know, the system of our rehabilitation versus the adult criminal justice system, um, which is which is also a farce. Um, they're used in the same way uh, to signal criminality, right? And and we have uh, trouble of of, of not wanting to use these things because we have a presumption uh, that those in these systems, connected to these systems, um, need to be monitored, they need to be controlled. Um, and again, that, that ties back to them being um, black and brown. Um, another point I wanna, I wanna make um, is uh, connected to thinking about um, uh, the distinctions between pretrial and, and, and trial and, and post-conviction as well. I think we need to be, um, um, careful in, in, in how we do that um, and the impact that it may have on those who are um, placed on electronic monitoring at, at other stages. Um, so how do we do that in a, um, a coordinated way um, that doesn't um, make it harder uh, for those um, who aren't on electronic monitoring pretrial but in, at, at other stages um, to effectively um, push back and fight, right? So how is this part of a larger, broader um, movement um, to abolish the use of this technology um, uh, generally, um, and, and then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is um, I'm not I'm not quite sure how we um, you know dismantle and, and and push back on these these systems of you know racial oppression if we aren't willing um, to, to to call it out, um, and you know it's, it's something that um, I'm. I'm I wrestle with uh, myself, right? So even as a as a as a public defender and, and representing individual clients, you know, like how do I how do I bring up um, you know the racial dimensions of this in a way that doesn't um, harm my individual client that I'm representing in, in court at that moment, or the client that I'll represent coming up next, or the next day, or next or the next week, right? Um, and we all hold different. Um, positions and, and, and vantage points. So maybe it's it's a team approach, you know, so those you, you have strategy for those who are on the inside and, and um, you know, and, 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 and we must be, you know, cognizant of that we are not alone, right? I mean, there are, if, if you aren't the ones actually saying and voicing like, this is about racial surveillance, this is for nation, you know, there's, there's a whole body of scholarship out there, right? There's experts um, who, are, who are writing 
um, in this in this space and in this field and, and challenging us to, to think about this way, uh, think about these practices in, in, in new ways um, and in, in important ways. So, so share um, that, that scholarship, that knowledge as well. And, and um, to the extent that if you do decide that certain strategies may not uh, be uh, right for, for elevating certain aspects of, of the challenges, um, at least when we have our conversations amongst one another, um, we should be very clear on uh, what our goals are and what our motivations are and how we understand these, uh, these systems and strategies. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Chaz. Kate, you got any concluding comments for us? This has been such a great um, conversation. I'm so glad it's happening. And one of the reasons is I think that, you know, when we're thinking about electronic monitoring, it's impossible to talk about it in a vacuum and not see the ways it's connected to um, historical modes of racial oppression and modern modes of racial oppression, and also connected to other social, quote unquote, social justice reform. So for example, one, you know, with bail reform, um, and even, you know, a so-called bipartisan support to end mass incarceration, um, electronic monitoring is often touted as the answer, is like, you know, instead of bail, let's have electronic monitoring, instead of prisons, let's have electronic monitoring. And so I do think that, and that comes not just from the usual suspects, you know, um, kind of more conservative right-wing suspects, but it also comes from within our own ranks. In other words, you know, I've, I've had to have hard conversations with law professors who are writing about bail reform and arguing in favor of electronic monitoring. Um, and so I do think that um, there's a real need to have a coordinated conversation about advocacy efforts and to have hard conversations that um, do call out the racialized nature of monitoring um, in really explicit ways that doesn't, you know, hurt individual clients and individual cases, but still moves the ball forward um, in meaningful ways. So, um, so I, I think this conversation is is hopefully part of, you know, an on, ongoing conversation about some of these broader issues. So, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Nikki. You want to jump in? I do. I really appreciate you know, that messaging. And I think that for me, oh gosh, to like, not, it's never ever about white women. So I'm not trying, I mean, I don't want it to ever be about white women. So that's not what I'm saying. But like, given everything that's going on, I definitely don't want it to, to contribute to this idea that we wouldn't talk very openly about race. I also know it's a privilege of mine that when I do that, you know, I'm not shut out or shut down. So, I mean, I'm happy to do that. I think that one of the things that Shar, Shar was saying earlier that we've learned our lesson on in Milwaukee is regardless of what, what it is, whether it's <clears throat> the racialized you know, um, aspects of um, electronic monitoring or just detention not being necessary or whatever it is, what, when we say it, they dismiss it, they minimize it, they say we don't know what we're talking about, they get upset with us. Um, I mean, it's changed, it's evolved a lot over the last year or so, maybe a couple of years, but it, it was a lot of that. But when someone from the outside comes in and says that same exact thing, it's like, oh my God, we got to change this right now. I can't yes. be doing this. And so that's the frustrating thing. So I feel like, and again, I know that you all aren't just focused on Milwaukee. This is a national problem, but um, to the extent that local um, you know, municipalities want to evolve and change and show others they can too. I think what Char was saying is really important. Like they need a model, they need inspiration, they need to point to someone else and say, look, they did it. Um, they don't, our advocacy has really been blunted. So I absolutely 100%, like we used to go at them very hard on race and then there was a backlash for that. Um, but now I think it is changing a bit. So I would just hope that, you know, one of the, um, the, the products of these conversations could be a way for ex national experts, obviously virtual is fine now, uh, to come into the spaces with judges, to say all of these things they need to hear and let them sit with it, you know, let them be confronted with it. And, you know, maybe that'll resonate. And I'm really hoping that we can maybe do something like that in Milwaukee. Thanks, Charlene. You want to add to that, and then we'll close with James. 
Absolutely. Um, I'll just quickly say, you know, um, thank you so much. This is so, so timely um, that we're having this conversation right now. And it's such a moment for us to um, really begin to start pushing on um, policies and um, how our individual cities are using EM, um, particularly with, you know, overall, but particularly with young people. Um, I have to reiterate, you know, as far as what Chaz was talking about, the racial inequity. We understand that when, um, because of um, the, the racism that is perpetuated here uh, in Milwaukee, uh, the communities of color are saturated with police. So guess what? The folks that are coming to, to the front doors of jails and detention centers are young people of color, are Black youth. And so when we talk about the inequity, yes, there is a huge disparity when we talk about young people just fu being funneled um, into the system, um, even through schools, that whole school to, um, school to prison pipeline mantra. Um, we, we know that youth of color are just disproportionately impacted. So we know that there is some, you know, overt things that we must um, address on the front end. Um, and, and, and I have to go back, um, and I think Kate talked about, you know, just the data, right? When we were looking at this sort of 10 point model, like, you know, maybe number 11 should be there is no empirical data that says that um, electronic monitoring monitoring works. So that's all um, I'll add, but it, it is definitely a moment and a time for us to do some, some things di very different. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, James, take us home, please. Oh, thank you very much. And so I just want to say that if you all are looking for a model, I think you have to make it. I think you have one of the greatest concentration of people in one place doing research on this in a, in a lot of different ways with, a, with an incredible kind of insight, not only into the technology, but being able to frame this in the context of racial justice is like so critical. And in a state like Wisconsin, in a city like Milwaukee, I mean, it's so, it's so paramount in terms of how it fits into the whole, you know, systemic racism in the criminal legal system uh, across the country. So I think this is an amazing, you know, body of people to actually take that work forward. Obviously, some of us from outside can come in and have conversations, but you all, you know, you all really have a critical mass of people doing some amazing, some amazing stuff here. And it sounds like other people are coming on board. So that's, so that's wonderful. Um, so a couple things I would just say in terms of research, I mean, just to follow up on the emphasis that people have put on the fact that electronic monitoring really is the continuation of the tracking of black bodies, the tracking of immigrant bodies that's been going on for, for centuries. But we don't have data, very much data to talk about how it's the racial disparities and the ways in which electronic monitoring is used. And I think that's going to be an important thing in terms of trying to push back against the use of this, of this uh, technology. Um, so, that, that, so, and I mean, I'm FOIA at a lot of places trying to get racial breakdowns of pe people on electronic monitor, and the data is pretty, pretty thin. Most jurisdictions say they don't even keep it. Um, secondly, I would say that in, in, that one of the reforms we can press for is to is to obligate them to file to file an annual report or an assessment or an evaluation of an electron of their electronic monitoring program with specific things that they have to measure. All of you are involved in research. When you write a research proposal, you have to say what's going to be the outcomes and what's going to be the impact of this research. But these people keep getting these electronic monitoring programs without any accountability. If you try to FOIA for um, evaluations, reports, assessments of electronic monitoring, almost every jurisdiction is going to come back and say, we've never done anything like this. They're not accountable. As researchers, that's one of the things that you can actually do to press them to be, to be accountable so that they have to generate data on those programs and, 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 their, and, their, and their impact. So those are just a, a couple of suggestions in terms of research agendas. I know you've got You've also got some exciting research agendas locally, and it's just great to be in touch with everybody. And I want to thank Rob and Marisol and everyone for organizing this call. Much appreciated. Well, we thank you all, and we certainly know how important our conversation was in October just to get us all uh, working in a coordinated way. And we will continue these efforts, uh, and we will look forward to more and more conversations. And we will also 
uh, continually rely on one another to make sure that research agendas and advocacy uh, is moving in as aligned a way as possible. And so we, we, we thank you for your uh, professional and activist related relationships and efforts. And at that point, uh, folks, we're gonna wrap up our call today. Um, we thank you all for your time. Please offer a virtual round of applause for these folks. They are doing uh, the kind of work that we have to uh, stay directly connected to, and we certainly will. Uh, thank you for your time today, folks, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Everyone take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.